so I wanted to give just a little background before we get into the discussion with the instructors about how this all came about. Um, so it's based, our discussion here is based on, as Mike mentioned, participation in a TLDF project um, that our T helped to help to lead. And it grew out of a needs assessment in the Faculty of Arts that was done, I think around 2018, where Arts SIT worked with a group of instructors to, to, get, to collect needs from instructors across the faculty about which learning technologies were most important to them um, to enhance the support of those. And one of the themes that emerged was the need for collaborative writing tools and support for collaborative pedagogies. And so Arts SIT, along with a group of co-applicants, instructors submitted a TLF project that was funded. And then between January 2021 and January 2023, um, worked with nine different instructors and even more courses um, across the two years to pilot um, and evaluate different types of collaborative learning activities, different types of technologies, um, across a range of different disciplines. Um, in year one of the project, all of the courses utilized Microsoft Teams Office 365 as the primary tool for collaboration. And then in year two, all of the courses gave students choice about which tools they would use. And then for the evaluation, student feedback was collected through surveys. So each of the classes, there was a survey um, to collect student experience. In year one, um, there was also instructor interviews done to understand what the instructor's motivations were for adopting collaborative pedagogies, along with some of their experience with the pilots and the courses, some of the challenges, some of the learning benefits they saw. In addition, in year two, um, we did focus groups with students to dig deeper into some of the issues and questions that emerged in the surveys in year one. Um, and then we collected all of this into a final report, which we will share um, at the end of this. So we didn't want to spend too much time going over the details of the evaluation results. I think the discussions with the instructors will be more interesting, but we will share all that information at the end and share a link to our report. So to get started, I will pass this over. We'll hear from the instructors now who will introduce their courses in a little bit of context before we get into the discussion. Um, so I'll pass it over to Catherine, who can talk about um, what she did in sociology. Great, thanks, Jason. Um, so Global Pandemics is a sociology course that explores the subfield of disaster studies, and it's a medium-sized course with no prerequisites, so it draws students from across campus, and it's also approved uh, as part of UBC's health and society minor, so there's a, a whole variety of students in the class. Um, in January 2023, when I taught it, we focused on COVID-19 as well as some historic pandemics and other types of crises that intersect with pandemics, like the climate crisis, like um, the opioid epidemic and gender-based violence. And throughout the term, the goal is for students to explore this big idea of social vulnerability, asking how does inequality shape um, the capacity that groups have to anticipate and prepare for pandemics and other disasters, to cope with them as they're happening, and then to recover from, uh, from the pandemic or disaster, both in the short term and the long term. And the course weaves collaboration into everyday classes through uh, group case studies every week, and as well as a major assessment called a community partner interview synthesis that I'm going to focus on today. Um, for this synthesis, student teams interviewed a nonprofit organization that supported vulnerable, vulnerable communities uh, during COVID-19. And each team at the end of the term produces a public facing report or media artifact uh, explaining the societal challenges presented by the pandemic and ways that their specific organization work to address these challenges. Um, and final assignments were delivered to the community organizations, some of whom drew upon um, the student work for their media promotion, like on Instagram um, or for grant writing. And this assignment was designed and facilitated with Tamara Baldwin and Gaylene Davies from UBC's Office of Regional and International Community Engagement. I couldn't have done um, any of it without them. Uh, in terms of technology, um, I gave a presentation to the students about Microsoft Teams, and we also had a Teams workshop facilitated um, by Arts ISIT. But students um, were actually allowed to decide on their own what uh, technological platform they ended up uh, using. And I can talk more about that process in, um, in the Q&A. And uh, the most important thing that I learned from this, I think, is uh, time. So I... I would encourage everyone to budget 
extra, like double the amount of prep time that you anticipate, and then also the time you think it'll take to sort of administer and facilitate the assignment throughout the term. And also not just for uh, instructors time, but also budgeting time for students to complete it. Uh, so not adding it as an additional course component, but but building it into class time whenever possible to give them time to work on it. Okay, that's all for me. I will pass it on. Thanks. Great. Yeah, let's head over to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Siobhan Woodick McPhee with G uh, Geography 121. Good morning, everyone. Uh, sounds like Catherine and I may have the same cold <laughs> stone around. <laughs> um, so yeah, so 121, I've actually been teaching this course for, well, almost all of the 10 years that I've been at UBC, and it's had various uh, recreations over that time. Um, but this particular, well, always though, I have a focus on uh, case studies. So um, just to give a context as well, it's a first year course. It's a requirement for our um, environment and sustainability minor. Uh, and it's a major and minor. And it's also um, a requirement for our urban major and minor. And it also attracts, it's an art selective um, it'll be part of the new place and power. Um, and we get a lot of science students actually who take it as their um, art selective. So we get students from all over campus. Um, and so the course, as I said, I always have a, um, a focus on case studies to really try and ground um, the, the abstract geographical concepts that we're looking at and which are fundamental for students going forward. So things like place, space, time, space, compression, political ecology, uh, settler colonialism. These are all terms they may have heard, they may be aware of, but really grounding them in uh, in geography and in, in the place that, that uh, we're in as well. So the case studies really help with that. Um, and so uh, you, I try and make them as relevant to students' life as possible. So during, these were always done um, in person, even when the course uh, switched to blended, um, sorry, to, to online during the pandemic, uh, there was the most, the, the case studies had always been done in person. Obviously with the pandemic, this changed. And so I was exploring ways that this could um, continue to be done, the collaboration could continue. Uh, hence my involvement with Jason and the, the large TLEF. So um, I was on leave for the second year of the TLEF. So um, uh, I obviously didn't do the second part, but for the first part, uh, the students use the Microsoft Teams um, in order to do their group work around the case studies. So they were allocated um, an hour of time a week uh, and it was in their schedule, but they could meet at any time that suited them because it was it was online, it was not in person. Um, this was when we were back in person. So this was in 2021, um, the autumn term, but uh, this course was a blended course. So part of it was, um, in synchronous and part of it was asynchronous. Um, in terms of how uh, we facilitated students using the technology, um, we I did give an overview in the uh, Zoom lecture and I actually had Mike as my one of my TAs uh, for the course and he was specifically focusing on the use of Microsoft Teams and the collaborative because there were 360 students in this class. So it was a larger class. Um, so Mike created a short video to show them how to use it. And then in terms of how we assessed it, uh, what we asked students to do is to use the file option in Microsoft Teams, which enables you to have multiple uh, dra um, drafts of the document. So we could go in and see the collaboration. And obviously then there's the chat and they could use the video option if they didn't weren't able to meet in person um so uh yeah as i said specifically it, it allowed for student case studies to happen anywhere anytime um which really helped with the notion of a blended course uh that there were moments in the course where the students all had to be together with me the instructor uh are in their discussion sections and then there were other moments where it was really up to them to um 
And, and that for me is part of the collaboration. It's the tool, but also it's the negotiation of when they meet uh, in what, like whether they meet in person, um, because the, you know, with using these tools, it isn't only to facilitate them all being uh, flung across uh, different parts of Vancouver, the lower mainland, you know, some of them did actually meet on campus and then just get, use the teams for uh, drafting the very, the different uh, iterations of their assignment. Um, so yeah, about being an active learner and collaborating and taking responsibility for their own learning. So I'll stop there. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Siobhan. Uh, could we move on to Dr. Uh, Brienne uh, or Alvarez uh, with Spanish 280 Revolution? Thank you so much. Um... So my the course that I did this project with was Spanish 280, and I did it in two different contexts. One was completely online and one was um, in person with sort of a multi-access group activity on Fridays. Um, so Spanish 280 is actually a course taught in English. Don't be fooled by the course code. Um about revolution. And the course was created for students that are interested in satisfying the arts literature requirement. So it is for non-majors and minors. Um, and also it's the idea of the course is to build interest in content related to Hispanic studies in English so that perhaps students would be enticed to take a course in Spanish, in the Spanish language, um, and explore some of the content that we have in our courses there. So the course, um, was large for me and our courses are typically 40 student enrolled and this one has about 80 typically with TA support. So I was benefiting from a large class and then also TA support. And um, in my experience, the in the in-person version, the classroom space is really important and I'll, I'll explain why in a second, but um, for the online, of course, breakout groups and Zoom was, was quite helpful. So this course, similar to the, the courses explained already, does revolve around a big question or a core question. And it was how does revolution evolve from throughout the 20th century and into the 21st centuries in Latin America. And so we explored um, texts, typically testimonial in nature, first person narratives of participants in different revolutionary movements. Um, from Mexico, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela as a sort of um, emblem of a humanitarian crisis that a lot of our students were actually interested in and wanted to learn more about. Um, so the, the core question focus made it very easy to involve a new technology and also to involve students as much as possible in the learning process. Um, in terms of collaborative learning, this course has a really interesting um, setup in that I was typically doing a lecture on Mondays and then Wednesdays was a typical seminar where we would do some engagement in small groups. And then Fridays were almost completely student facilitated. So I would have um, anywhere from eight to 10 student facilitators and they were in charge of a 30 minute session with groups of eight to 10 students each. So the process of collaborating was a multi-step one. Um, they would need to turn in a facilitation guide to me by Wednesday, and then I would give immediate feedback to all of the presenters for or facilitators for the Friday session. And the idea was to give them a sort of inquiry-based feedback on their guide from anywhere from questions about you know, what, how do you think your group members would respond to this type of question to, um, you know, you've brought in an outside source, maybe we could contextualize it a little bit further so that it jives better with what we're talking about in the, in the texts of the week, things like that. So just giving them feedback um, that I might expect if I were giving a lesson on a topic to a group of peers. And then um, the students facilitated this session and they used OneDrive as a collaborative tool. Um, so similar to Google Drive, there was a doc that, that the facilitators were taking notes on, both in the online version and the in-person one of this course. And the idea was that the facilitator would take notes on some of the key takeaways of the session so that the other students that were in different groups with different facilitators would have 
sort of a, a bird's eye view of what had happened in each of the discussions. And this was particularly important because another collaborative tool that I used were, was Canvas discussions. It was a large course. It was a writing centered course. And so I wanted to make sure that students were able to articulate um, some of the key skills that we look for in a writing course, summary, um, framing of opinions, um, evidence-based research, because the final project was a research-based project. So they were gaining all of these skills through the Canvas discussions and the, the collaboration through OneDrive. So um, it was a complex process, but the student-facilitated nature made it very easy to do multiple things at once with the same core topic each week. Um, so the the activity that students were that I was mentioning that students were facilitating each Friday was called the assembly and the assembly was essentially a student led tutorial that happened within the same classroom space digital or physical and so I found that for the online based course, the Zoom rooms, we all know what a breakout room experience is like. It can be intimidating. It can be um, having just a couple of people dominating the discussion. So I found that the use of OneDrive was really helpful for, for getting people who didn't want to be on screen able to participate in the discussion and add their feedback and comments in ways that were inclusive and inviting, and then we would see their voice. It was also helpful for me because um, I was one instructor and there was one TA, and we had anywhere from eight to 10 breakout groups in the online section um, each Friday. So it was impossible for me to jump from group to group and spend meaningful time there. And so the TA and I would sort of target specific groups um, where we would spend time each Friday so that each group was getting some attention. But from the back end, we could see exactly what was happening through OneDrive in each and every of the groups. So if we saw a discussion happening that we were really enticed by, we would jump in and, and see what had happened there. So it was, it was sort of helping me... Um, explore the group dynamics without having to actually physically be there. And then the same for the classroom experience. It was um, very easy for me to follow up with different groups on clarity I needed or questions that I had related to their dis discussion because of the OneDrive. Um, I, I can answer more questions. I know it's a complex um, activity, the assembly, but like Catherine, um, one thing that I learned is, yes, time management. I couldn't believe how long it took me, too. I, I felt like I would understand what I was using as a tool. It took me a long time to realize what OneDrive was and the students the same. And I think a big part of it was that the the terminology that they use to describe the technologies that they use, like Google Drive, Instagram, TikTok, um, Discord, like they just couldn't wrap their minds around the teams based terminology on the one hand. And then there was a lot of lag in the setup time because at the time when we were doing these projects, not all UBC students were coming in and getting a student.ubc.ca email address, which would allow them to use FIPA compliant tools. So it also took a while for them to understand why we were using uh, tools that were privacy protected at UBC and getting the buy-in um, when they're just so used to using Google and other things that are at their fingertips. So um, those were a couple of things that I used, and I'm happy to <laughs> reveal a few more in the question answer session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Brian. And um, just a reminder, if anybody does have any questions, we have fixed the chat. So you can just uh, put your questions right in there. Um, to start off, though, um, maybe one that we've kind of crafted, um, and that is what is the role of collaboration in your course designs? And what do you see as the value of collaborative learning in your specific disciplines? So geography, sociology, you know, Spanish and Italian studies, that sort of thing. Um, would any of the panelists like to kind of start off answering this question? Sure. Awesome. Um, so uh, I think that the the field of disaster studies that my course Global Pandemics focused on is uh, itself a really evolving field where leaders in the field in both theoretical and um, applied senses are 
demonstrating collaboration out of necessity for solving some of the really complex challenges that can't be addressed just from one disciplinary lens. Um, and so I wanted to <clears throat> guide students in also adopting that practice of, you know, thinking beyond the terminology and jargon of your own of your own journals and your own training and really trying to understand where other people are coming from and where you have common ground, where you can work together. And also, um, I think my hope is that uh, art students develop a, a set of transferable skills that are cultivated through collaboration, um, empathizing with others' perspectives and life experience, and also the capacity to um, sort of discuss ideas and weigh the pros and cons to come out with balanced arguments. Those are, those are things that can't be done, you know, as an individual person. Um, and so because of, because of that, I built collaboration into the, I have a learning outcome specifically tied to collaboration in my course syllabus. And then, and then the case study assessments and the, the interview synthesis assessments also have learning uh, outcomes tied to collaboration. So I, I tried to make this transparent for students and to justify the significance that I, I thought, uh, I think this holds in the learning um, process. And then I think more generally for myself, um, scholarship and teaching has never been an individual process. I'm always consulting with people and drawing on other people's work and learning from mentors. So I don't really see any of the work that we do as, um, you know, fun in isolation. Yeah. And, you know, you, you mentioned that they're working with community groups, right? So it's not just students collaborating with one another, but collaborating with, you know, nonprofits and NGOs and such. So how, how does that fit into sociology? Like, Oh yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I think in the context of the course and in sociology more broadly, uh, I tried to set it up so that the community members were the experts on their lived experience so that the students were learning from um, the community members. And so a part of that was for student teams to have time in class to research their organization, to brainstorm um, the interview questions they wanted to ask them. And then they had to agree as a group on the interview questions. Um, and then they had to uh, nominate a communications coordinator for their group who would actually reach out to the community partner. And that was really intimidating for some students um, just to write the email and try to set the meeting time. Um, so that was a learning process as well. And then all of the team members were, were on the interview um, and then they had to synthesize what the community partner said um, and bring in broader research and present it back to the community partner. So it was, um, yeah, it, all of it was a pretty collaborative uh, process. And we were really grateful for uh, the community partners taking the time to to speak with the students and to share their expertise. Fantastic. Um, Siobhan, Brianne, uh, any comments uh, for this one? Um, I mean, collaborative learning, you know, geographers have been described as good systems thinkers. I think we're good system thinkers because of the nature of the discipline, which is constantly in a dilemma of identity um, and why I find it so appealing. So, you know, having students work together is the very nature of, well, social science, if I'm being honest, to, to Catherine's point as well, but certainly within how how geography is done. Um, and, you know, it's it's always the dilemma of, do we do these kind of collaborative learning pieces in first year courses where you usually are dealing with uh, large classes, you're dealing with students from a whole uh, variety of faculties and, and departments. Um, and also, you know, they've many of them have just transitioned from high school. And so in collaborative work, you're, you're really asking them um, to be critical and to engage. And so and and yet I I think it's so important because uh, as you know to to Catherine and Brienne's courses which are two hundred level I've done more a lot more um, collaborative in third and fourth year where yes so sometimes it's working with community partners often it's students working on term long projects and those are really really important. Um, but for me, if it, it really needs to be introduced from first year. Um, and so it, it, these case studies allow me to do it in a, in a very kind of gentle way um, that is part of the assessment of the course um, that is linked to the objectives. Um, and, and then it's just 
navigating how to best organize that. And hence why we're here today to think about the tools that we use. Um, because I taught the same course this term and I actually decided to do the complete reverse, which is all the lecture material and all the content was all asynchronous. And the only in-person part was the group work. And I'm currently grading the assignments where I ask the students to reflect on that. And I will admit for someone who advocates for the use of technology and that, and I know I'm hoping we come to this a bit later, that the feedback from my first year students this term is, is, is what they're saying is they loved the group in person because it allowed them to bring together a lot of the asynchronous content sitting around a table with three other students. Um, can we recreate that in Microsoft Teams? I mean, I'll continue to try, but uh, yeah. But anyway, back to, that's why collaborative for me. And, and also just to echo what Catherine said, uh, I think as, as faculty members, we often silo ourselves, but I have learned the most when I work with others, especially outside my discipline, because it challenges me. Yeah, no, and I, as your TA for that course, that was certainly my experience was um, trying to kind of, I don't know, trying to recreate that that vibe, that that collaborative environment that they get in person in a Teams environment was really difficult. So, yeah. Um, Brianna, your course on revolution, I mean, revolution by its very nature is collaborative amongst uh, community members. Um, how, how did it fit into your discipline and what you were trying to teach your, your students? <clears throat> well, the, I think, you know, collaboration was a very key component. It's a key component in my teaching. The, it's part of my student centered approach to teaching, but the particular exercise or student led activity that students were working toward each week was called the assembly because in revolution, the assembly is the group that comes together to sort of forge ahead as a society. And so it was conceptual and practical in the course context that it was intentional to choose the assembly as the student facilitated activity. Um, and I think, you know, just to build off of what Siobhan was saying too, I mean, I think as academics, we often do work in isolation and then we are not trained to work as a team member in all settings. Um, at least in, in literary research, it's very solitary, right? We're just alone with our books and um, then we go to conferences and talk about things. But um, I wanted students to experience from a very early level, um, what it's like to work with team members from different disciplines with different opinions, particularly because when we talk about revolution, um, anything could come up. And I've been surprised to hear some of the things that do come up and how we um, work together to maintain a positive classroom environment. And so the concept led to collaborative discussions on what a safe and friendly classroom community, both in person and online through the discussions and through the OneDrive um, activities, you know, how we work together to, to hold each other accountable. Um, and I think another key component for this particular discipline was just modeling different ways of collaborating, because I think students often shudder when they think group project or something like that, because it is so time consuming. It's hard to find um, time to work together when they're all taking four or five courses, living on or off campus. And so I think just giving them a classroom space within which they can consistently come together to discuss the same topic and then seeing, um, seeing how different groups approached it. Because the way the assembly worked was I would choose a question and they knew the questions from the beginning. In fact, when they signed up to facilitate they were signing up for the question and texts of interest for them. So we read um, Gio Condabelli, who is a revolutionary from Nicaragua, and she is also a feminist poet. And so one of the weeks we read about her, the topic was revolution and feminism. How does this work? And so the students that signed up were, you know, there were some big opinions and things, but it was really interesting to see just the diversity 
of ways in which the facilitators approach that topic and how they brought their disciplines and personal interests in and even the extra resources and stuff. So they all left each class period with a sort of um, takeaway of eight different ways to talk about one topic. So um, and then the Canvas discussions offered sort of a back channel way of continuing to reflect on the topic. So it was it was necessary and it was fun and it was not always easy, but I think it worked. Yeah. Did you have any like specific approaches you used to facilitate kind of uh, an inclusive and respectful atmosphere in your classroom? Did you come up with like a classroom agreement or or anything like that? Yeah, so that's a really great question. One of the first um, questions that I ask in the course is, what is revolution? And so you can imagine the amount of responses that you get to that seemingly simple question. And so during that exercise, when we're trying to define together what it is, how we all interpret the concept that we're going to explore together for 13 or 14 weeks, um, I sort of use that to pivot into um, active listening, like we've heard this classmate say this and this classmate say this and sort of modeling facilitation from the get go. And then, um, you know, when we share opinions as a class, you know, what is the expectation and reaction that we expect? So in a very subtle way, we're building sort of a manifesto to classroom space functionality. <laughs> so yeah, it's, I don't know if the students realize that that's what's happening, but definitely that's what's happening. And then the Canvas discussion space is more explicit. We kind of come up with guidelines together of like, you know, how do we hold each other accountable? If there's something that discomforts me, um, what do I do? And we, I have had to do that before, unfortunately, um, and act on it, but not too often. Yeah, I, I think that's so important. I know like Siobhan in geography, we've had students who's parents are in the midst of war and they're over here at university, right? Like th these sorts of topics can be really difficult for some students. And I, I think it's so great that you're creating that kind of atmosphere for them to have discussions in Bram. So yeah. Um, Jason, would you like to take over? Sure. So um, the next question we wanted to ask was more related to the learning technology. Um, so one of the interesting things that came out of the surveys and focus groups when we asked students about the types of technologies they were using is that even when instructors tried to encourage the use of UBC tools and Microsoft Teams, um, students often reported the, the tools that they use the most were like Instagram, um, Discord, Google Docs, and they use those things. So we're curious about how do you engage students around issues of digital literacy and some of the, I mean, we've heard talks about privacy and some of those questions. How do you gauge students around those topics and about the choices they're making with the tools that they're using? I don't know who wants to start. I'm happy to start this one off sure. briefly. Um, I, I mentioned this as one of my um, learning moments was the, just even the way we talk about technology is different. And I'll I'll be very brief because I'm sure there's a lot to say about this. But um, one of the things that, that I noticed was that um, when these tools were implemented, particularly in 2020, when I did the first round, the there was not institutional support. So there wasn't like this, it wasn't widespread that we can use Teams. We have um, emails for all students that aren't the alumni email that is more for their personal um, use and things like that. So I did feel like there was a lot of setup and work to do to get their buy-in. Um, but if I were to do it again, and I think I did this the second time around, just knowing what technologies they use in advance of starting the work with the new technologies we were going to introduce help to sort of create parallels, right? So um, if I was going to use OneDrive, knowing that they were familiar with Google Drive was really helpful to explain the functionality of the tool, how we might be using it for our um, collaborative work in class, and then how they might use it to communicate with one another as group members. Um, there was also um, a student, I remember clearly, who just would never use OneDrive. There was just a complete rejection of 
the UBC based tool. So I didn't find a solution to that. They preferred discord and then their group needed to use discord to be um, in communication with those collaborative ideas in that particular group. So um, in a very early phase, if there was a rejection to something, I didn't really, I wasn't able to find a solution to it that was uh, privacy protected or FIPA compliant. So um, yeah, I think building it in, having the institutional support, having the parallel terminology to be able to work with them and help them understand why we're doing these sorts of things. And um, and then also how this complements the learning management system, Canvas, and how, how these things are all intertwined is really important to get student buy-in. Siobhan or Catherine, did you want to? Yeah, I, um, I mean, it's a tough question. And I think it's a tough question because as Brian just said, it's like, I think, you know, the approach of building on what they already know, like Google Drive and, um, but also maybe just thinking through um, the use of, of, of tools or technology as, you know, something more than just uh, social media. Um, and that, unfortunately, well, I don't know if unfortunately is the right word, but in my view is has to be inst faculty institutional wide. There's no point in Catherine, Brianne and I harping on day after day as we do with our students, encouraging them um, unless, you know, and then they go off to another course and they learn a completely different tool um, so then it becomes more about the tools rather than, you know, so it's nice, like in a session like this, where we're talking about the, the collaborative aspect. So it's less about the tool and more about the collaboration, because that's ultimately why we're all using the tool. Right. Um, so, you know, it, it's tough because, you know, students will say, um, you know, it's great that we're doing this and this and this, but it's just overwhelming um, and, and how many new tools. And I know that was a huge issue in the pandemic. Um, so I think we need, you know, as, uh, as a faculty, we're the three of us are in the Faculty of Arts. Um, but then, of course, as, as an institution, think about um, how we uh, approach the use of these tools. And if, if we're interested in our disciplines and collaboration, how we foster that. Um, if we're, you know, thinking about other ways of, of uh, approaching asynchronous courses uh, that isn't just watching hours and hours of videos, then that's another conundrum. So it's like approaching it more as like big questions that we need to think about. So here we're thinking about collaborative learning. And, and I personally happen to think that Microsoft Teams is a great tool outside of our classes. In fact, the um, Arts ISIT, if any of you were at the Arts ISIT conference, welcome back conference in early August, um, the staff, uh, the Arts, IT, uh, Arts ISIT staff uh, did a presentation on how they use Microsoft Teams um, in a very collaborative way. Um, I'm just speaking from what I saw at the presentation. So maybe Jason, you can add more to that. But I thought that was really interesting. And I know in other spaces I've been involved with on campus, we've been asked to use it and there's been a lot of resistance from faculty members. So it's, um, it's you know, I, and I know even within my own department, we've gradually over time being coerced into using the, you know, the the, the airspace and that. So it's, it's more like a, a sense of like, we need to all get on the same page. Doesn't matter how you, I mean, this is not talking about how you do things in your own classroom. I know that's our, our, our private space, so to speak, but I think it is more about like, what are we trying to do here? Like, what are our objectives when we use the technology? So that's how I think about digital literacy. And I think it's on us and so like our students, yes, they may be born with iPhones in their hands, but um, that doesn't mean they know how to use them. Uh, in the way that we're thinking about critically, just because you have, you know, uh, um, well, just because you can afford a fancy car doesn't know, you know, doesn't mean you know how to drive it. So I think that, yeah. 
cars ro- racing by me as I cycle up to UBC. So that's why it's in my head. <laughs> Yeah, Siobhan, one thing that I thought was interesting that you brought up in one of our planning meetings, too, was how students were using the collaborative documents, even when you were having them discuss in person. I was wondering if you wanted, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, sure. I I mean, and I think this is more, and I'll put my geography hat on here, I think this is more a, 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 a moment of the context of the pandemic and my first year students, a lot of whom did the last two years of high school fully online and maybe even the first year of university. Um, so in, as I said, this year, my students do the, the group work, the case studies in person. And I noticed in the first class or so that many of them are just pulling up a Google Doc and the three or four of them are sitting around a table looking at each other, but working on a Google Doc, so not speaking. And I sat, I, I'd sit down with them and ask them and, and they just said, we were all, they, I could see they were all communicating, but they were doing it through text. And for them, that was the, and I, and I didn't push it because honestly, I'm like, well, why should I be telling them, no, you have to speak. They are collaborating. Isn't that the point of the exercise? Um, so again, I'm reading their reflective papers now, and it is interesting how for some students that was great, and for others there, because I got them to switch groups halfway through the term, just to, you know, mix it up. And some of them said, oh, in my first group, we did a lot of discussion, but in my second group, everyone just wanted to work on a Google Doc. So again, in in both of those situations, it's it's both subjective in like how the student wants to approach things. Um, so they have to work that out with their group members. But ultimately, you know, those groups who were using Google Docs and those groups who were having conversations, if I were to do it, do a statistical analysis just from grading them each week, yes, the groups who did do more conversation over the course of the term did get better and did score higher. But the groups who were using Google Docs or whatever, you know, collab also did well. It was just a different form of communication. So back to my point of like, what's the objective? Is it how to use the tool or is it collaboration? Catherine, did you have anything to add on this question? Yeah, for sure. So I couldn't agree more with uh, Brianne and Siobhan. I think that um, for me, until the um, until there are standardized technical platforms across UBC that are supported, you know, from from first year on. I've been focusing in global pandemics in giving on giving students a sense of agency um, and about what technology they want to use and making sure that their decisions are really intentional and transparent. And I think that's where the digital literacy comes in for me in this course. Um, so I presented the pros and cons of Microsoft Teams to students and made sure they knew there was lots of support for it. But then I ultimately allocated class time for groups to um, discuss the pros and cons of the other platforms that they use as well. Um, And then the group, actually each group decided for themselves what what technology they wanted to use and also how they wanted to use it. Like what would they share where and, you know, who was available in the morning, who was available in the evening, just getting a sense of their schedules. And I think in the end, um, about 20% of, of teams used Microsoft Teams in my course. So that's kind of low. Um, And then the other teams sort of used a combination of platforms they were already using and that they decided together were accessible to all their members. And, you know, I understand, like, recently I was on a research team and everyone decided to use Slack. And I was like, whoa. And I had to learn about it really quickly. And that kind of, it, it, it took a kind of a couple hours to figure that out. And I was falling behind on discussions and I was like, well, there wasn't an email about this. And everyone's like, it was in Slack. So um, yeah, I, I have empathy for them. It's interesting that you bring that up because I mean, we were talking about the students using a lot of new technologies like discord and Instagram and everything. Have you three learned much about these new digital tools through your students at all while teaching these courses if they're using all of these new technologies learning isn't one way but that's simply why i'm asking so yeah i think um the i'll speak specifically to discord because um i've been i'm an advisor for majors and minors in spanish so i've been meeting with a group of students that are majors and minors and trying to learn more about what 
what they would like from us as faculty members. And the sense that I got was not the sense. It was a real thing. They said they want a discord channel, but they don't want faculty there. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, great. So you want a student channel without faculty involvement. And then they want like a faculty student channel of communication. So it's really interesting. They do seem to separate out like the discord and wanting to have that because they know how it works and it seems to work well for student clubs and things here. Um, but they recognize that that is their space. And so I thought that was really interesting. Um, and then we, we have an Instagram, um, and YouTube, we have everything in FHIS. Um, and they were like, we didn't know that. Where are you guys? And I was like, wow. Okay. So you guys are on, you're using Instagram actively, but they don't seem to merge these together with academics. So I don't know how to how to bridge that gap. If if we have Instagram, we have YouTube, we have everything as a department, but then students aren't seeking out academic content in these sites that they like for socials, right? So it was interesting. Uh, in terms of have I learned a lot? Um, um, I think I mean I I love new ways of approaching the world generally so and yeah I, I yeah so I think I learn more from my students I'm amazed at how they use the tools and also how and, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way because I think this is in general problem how little they know about the tools and I mean things like, you know, privacy, um, and but also the full breadth of how tool the tools can be used. Um, so it's it's um and that back to the point of digital literacy, I think it's it's that, you know, and I think so I'm amazed. And it's interesting, you know, talking more to students now who are in uh up, not so much the first years, but more third and fourth years, uh, cr critiquing Instagram, for example, as a social media platform, which really I know a lot of our students use. Um, and starting to reflect on the fact, like I had one student who was uh, saying that they questioned their parents as to why they put so much of them on there when they were a kid, you know, um, and how, so I was like, great. Yeah. That start asking those questions. Right. It's not saying don't use Instagram. It's more about thinking about <clears throat> how you're using it. So I think I, I'm just fascinated with, um, how my students approach, uh, using the various tools. Um, and then again, how they use, um, collaborative tools and social networking tools in their own life uh, and in their university life too. Yeah, as they go on and they start communicating things as experts in academics, right? They're going to be using all these tools and learning to critically evaluate how they're doing that is just so important. So, yeah. Catherine, I don't know if you have anything to add to that or if we should move on to the next question, but yeah. Um, no, yeah, you can move on. Thanks. Can I say one more thing? Sorry, I just thought of something fun that you might all be interested <laughs> in. Yeah, of course. Um, this is with my second years, which also has a collaborative piece, but not that they've told me very adamantly. Now, this is a small sample size that online dating is on the way out for them, that they're like done with the whole. Yeah, so we'll see. As I said, this is a small social geography class. <laughs> so um, I don't know, maybe something to come in terms of how uh, these tools are being used. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I guess moving on, um, the the last thing that came up a lot um, while we were speaking to students uh, during the study was that uh, grading fairness was a, a, a major concern for them. Uh, so they were looking at, um, you know, how can grading fairness and group submissions, uh, how can the grading be equitable? And like, how can uh, profs ensure that um, the distribution of work uh, was equitable? 
what strategies do all of you use in your courses to kind of address these concerns? Because, uh, yeah, they, they came up a lot. So. Um, I can oh, go for it, Catherine. Oh, okay. Thanks. Sorry. Um, I allocated class time early in the term for teams to actually um, you know, read through the assignment instructions and draft a work plan step by step, which I think is a really useful skill for students in second year because they might not even be doing that for themselves on their own assignments yet. Um, so yeah, developing a work plan um, and then identifying who's going to be responsible for each each step. And then later on in the term when they submit their assignment, they include an appendix that includes the work plan. Um, and a report of who actually did finish the task. So there's some built-in accountability, but it's written by the group themselves. Um, I also encourage students to bring up, if they do feel an issue is developing, to, to try to address it and think about it immediately so that it doesn't get larger. And then by the end of the term, it's sort of too late. So we try to make a, um, a formative shift in how the group is evolving. So I did have one student who came to me uh, midway through the term and we were able to chat about strategies and then they they felt that based on um, based on their sort of new plan, they were able to shift the dynamic and they didn't have to get a regrade at the end of the term, which was really nice. Um, also, I build, um, I think it's just like 1% into an iPeer uh, reflection on your own work and your peers' work, uh, which has a qualitative component and a quantitative component. And so the qualitative component is to encourage students to think about their own contributions to the team and what they learn and what they could do differently. And then the quantitative component helps me assess whether I need to reach out to the groups to talk about a possible uh, regrade, which I didn't actually have this term. Um, yeah. How was, how was iPeer? Like, was it easy for the students to use? Uh, did you have any difficulties getting them to use that tool? I haven't had any difficulties getting them to use it. I think it's just a link that I build into Canvas. Um, I think it's pretty. I think it's pretty simple for them. I haven't had anyone complain about it. It took me maybe like an hour to figure it out, and then I have my standard rubrics that I can use again and again. Um, so that's that's nice. After you put in the the hour the first time, you're pretty much good to go. Oh, so you can kind of front load the work then. Yeah. Because oh, okay, that that's great. Because I mean, one thing that you all brought up was how much time. Uh, collaborative learning takes for you. So um, I also really liked how you mentioned kind of that scripting for students at the beginning, because that is something that is backed up in the literature on this again and again, is that students need scripts and examples of roles and how to interact with each other. Like, so, yeah. Yes. And I think that actually next time I teach this course, I'm going to provide um, sample work plans because students, even if they try to to identify all the steps, they're still going to miss some. So I'm going to provide them with actually more structure for that piece. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, Brianne, uh, were you going to say something at the beginning here? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in now too. Um, just to build off of what you just said, Catherine, I think one of the keys to collaborative work in the course that I've taught, which I've taught, I mean, I think since 2011, I've probably taught it five times. So quite a few times. Um, is actually providing them a sample facilitation guide and a template to get them going um, for the assembly activity because it does, um, it takes me a couple of weeks for them to understand what the assembly is. So I have to model it two times before we have a student facilitator come in and then these supporting documents have been really key to having them, them jump in. Um, and so in terms of the grading, I students are very grade centered, I've noticed. And um, so I build, I have sort of a scaffolded approach to grading and giving feedback in different ways to students for this particular assignment. It's not something that I do for all of the course assignments, but for the assembly facilitation guide and facilitation activity in general. Um, students, I have TA support, so the students um, are required to turn their guides in on Wednesday if they're facilitating on Friday. And so the TAs hold office hours on Tuesday and Wednesday so that the students have a chance to kind of get some feedback from them before they turn it in to me. And then the feedback that I don't give them a grade before the facilitation because the whole process itself is, is graded from the in-class experience that they create, the guide they've created to do that, 
and then their co-facilitation and engagement in the Canvas discussion after throughout the, the weekend. So the discussion is open from Friday after class through Wednesday of the next week. So it's an entire cycle of, of an experience. Um, but I give inquiry-based guidance, so I ask questions. And based on those questions, they go back and make adjustments or they respond to the question and saying, oh yeah, I thought about that and this is the solution that I've come up with for that. So it's sort of a dialogue before the Friday session. So it is a lot of work for the instructor and the TA, but it's so rewarding because in a class of 80, this is also my opportunity to get to know them and how they think and and to really um, get them excited about co-facilitating. And I think that um, I've had at least three students over the years go on to do student-directed seminars, um, which are opportunities for students to actually lead a course on their own, come up with a syllabus and stuff like that. So I do think that that's a very small percentage, but it's something, and the goal is to get them doing things. Um, and then the day of the facilitation, peers give feedback, and they use the same rubric to give feedback as I use to give feedback. And I have a... <laughs> I have a daughter who is in the Vancouver school system. And so they have a four point scale. It's like extending, proficient, developing, beginning. And so I have created wording for each of those categories. And then they get that plus uh, a number grade and a letter grade, of course. Um, and so I, I think it helps giving that general feedback. And then I give personalized feedback, of course, before and after the session. Their peers always score them extremely high. Everyone is extending in their mind, but their comments say something different. So it's interesting just um, seeing how they want to rate their peers highly, but then they do want to give um, you know, kind of constructive critiques. And so I, I give an, I anonymize the feedback. It's always anonymous anyway, but I give the peers who have facilitated all of the comments that have come. Um, because most students, even if it's a, a criticism, it's very, uh, properly formed and it's constructive. So I give them all the, the feedback and then they do their own self-reflection so that, metacognition as part of learning is is built in. So it's very complex. Um, but I do find that because I use an inquiry-based approach to giving them initial feedback, they also use initial or um, inquiry-based approaches to giving themselves feedback. Like I could have done this differently. Could I have done this differently? Yes. And if I would have, this is what would have happened. So that kind of aftermath um, reflection is really important too. So that's kind of what I do. I I love that because I know as a graduate student, for instance, I didn't really learn about the intricacies of giving kind of constructive, critical feedback about other people's work until really my master's program, because it wasn't really a soft skill that was taught um, in a lot of my undergraduate courses. So yeah, you know, I, I, I love that you're doing that. And Siobhan, um, for your course, um, how did you like assess the collaboration of your students, I suppose, because they were they were they were posting these things online, right? So yeah, so I mean, it's always it's really tough, and I, I've used uh, more peer feedback in my third and fourth year uh, courses, but that's usually also where um, uh, the 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 project is a is a term long project, and it's worth uh, like. In one of my fourth year seminars, it's worth like 55% of their grade. So it's a it's a decent amount. So the collaboration and the peer feedback is really, really important in in um, um in, in that piece. Whereas here with the first year, it's um uh this is 15% of their grade over the whole term, right? So it's a it's not that it's not important, but it's it's much more about um, the soft skill, if you want to call it that. But as Brianne said, students really do want grades as well. Um, and so that's the tough piece. Uh, so I, I don't use any peer um, feedback in um, the first year courses. I, I've just found that, that if there is a real issue, it, at least my experience and having taught this course numerous times, if there's a really big problem, the students have tended to come and speak to me. Um, but otherwise, it's usually just the usual like freeloaders or someone who's very opinionated. 
And honestly, that's a skill that I feel important that the students work it out, like between them. But in terms of grading it, so the, the, the submissions that the students make are graded on a weekly basis. Um, it's easy to monitor collaboration when it's in person, obviously. Whoever is not there just doesn't receive the grade. Um, online, how we did it with using Microsoft Teams was um, looking at the, the chat or if the students use the video option, uh, it posted that. Or if they did it in person, we looked at the, the drafts of the, um, the various uh, uh, um, submissions that they made, their file there. And, and I'll be honest, that wasn't done on a weekly basis. It was the TAs and I grading. It was kind of more, you get a sense. Uh, when we did it in the online, we let the students work the whole term with the same group because, you know, it does take longer to build rapport online. Um, so it was more checking in. I would check in on the various groups uh, uh, over the course of the term. And if I got a sense that there was one, and it did happen, there were a couple of groups where it was always one person posting in the chat, frustrated. Um, where is everyone? You know, we arranged to meet at this time. Why aren't you here? And so on. Um, I would then reach out to the group and, and uh, try and figure it out. And obviously always honor the person that was really putting in the effort. Uh, it does take a lot of work, I won't lie, especially in first year classes. Um, you really, um, yeah, you, you have to spend, you spend the time and you have to, it, you know, it's, it, it, I mean, obviously first year courses, I have, I had a, 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 a six TAs for that because it was such a large course, aside from Mike. Um, but of course you all have to be on the same page and asking them, you know, that it's not about necessarily uh, looking for problems, but it's more looking to see that there is like the students are being able to meet and see the, the why they're doing group work. You know, as I always joke at the start of the term and say, I, I don't make you do group work because I'm trying to punish you. You know, it's a, uh, yeah, it's an important part of learning. So it looks like Brianne, you, you've done the same there. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that last thing that you mentioned, though, we're not trying to punish you. We had a discussion um, kind of in the planning session surrounding teaching evaluations and collaborative learning, um, and that some of you have found that your teaching evaluations go down when you use collaborative learning in the classroom or do group work. Like, Can, can you speak about this a little bit and, and maybe how we could better support that as an institution? So. Um, sure. So uh, I've done collaborative learning in a number of courses. There was one course I had taught for five years um, with with a collaborative piece. And then I taught it one year. I was just so tired and I took the collaborative piece out and I got the best evaluations I ever got. And it was so frustrating um, because for me, it was like way less work. And I, I felt, you know, I felt bad that I hadn't done it. And, and then, yeah, so it just made me feel like, what are we being evaluated on? And I think that the benefits of collaboration might not be immediately um, prominent in the students' minds, but like six months later, a year later, their first job or something, or many of them are in work now, but, you know, down the road, I think that there are these intrinsic benefits that don't come out on evaluations. Yeah, and... When we surveyed students, 77% of them said that they thought the collaborative learning activities that were being run were positively impacting their learning. And then when asked if they would then like to do these collaborative activities again, it was something like 50% of them said that they'd be amenable to that. So they said that they were effective, but they didn't necessarily want to participate in them. And perhaps that has to do with how much work um, is associated with it, right? How much extra work both on your end and on their end. So, yeah. And like Siobhan, Brianne, like have, do you have any ideas on maybe how we could uh, get better buy-in from students about collaborative learning? Yeah. Um, no, 
I mean, <laughs> no, it, it, sorry. No, no, but it is, it's a case of, I mean, cause a hundred percent, I, I, and I'm in the privileged position of now being post tenure. I don't have full professor yet, but so I tend to be more open to doing those like your collaborative things that I know kill my evaluations because, you know, it's like, well, <laughs> what can I do? Um, and I think the only way is to keep doing it. And and it, which made me very sad, um, this term coming back after parental leave to see so many um, uh, of my colleagues going back to in-person exams, uh, you know, moving away from take home exams, two stage exams where there was a collaborative piece or projects over the term because of the fear of generative AI. And so, you know, it's like, we just got to keep pushing on. And, and so it's like, we're not going to, I mean, nobody like, I, I, I like sitting in my office and being left alone. And when someone comes and knocks at my door and says, we got to go for a coffee and figure this out. My first reaction is no, leave me alone. And then we go and then it's great, you know, and our students are the same. Like, it's like, of course, we have to we have to push. And so the finding of the survey is absolutely spot on. Like, it's like, um, yeah, it's like going to the gym, exactly, or getting on my bike to cycle up the hill. It's great once I'm here, but, you know, um, yeah. So I, the only answer I have is just to, Get to make that's why I make a joke out of it. I'm like, I'm not punishing you. I'm, I, you know, I was like, I, I use the example of as a faculty member, I've chosen to be in a faculty member because I get to spend most of my time by myself. Um, you know, but, but, but then when I do have to collaborate, it's very rewarding. Uh, but it does mean that I have to go outside of my comfort zone. Um, yeah. So I think it's just keep on pushing forward. Yeah. So sorry, yeah. no easy answer. Oh, I was expecting you to solve this problem right now, here and now. <laughs> uh, Brianne, any ideas? Yeah. I mean, I, I actually, I was trying to think about it. I can't recall off the top of my head what my student evaluations were in these courses, but um, I think my students had a really positive experience. I, during the pandemic, I think the overload of technology would have been mentioned for sure in that term that I that I would have implemented this plus Canvas plus Zoom, right? It was everything all at once. But I've actually, um, I've had students write in the evaluations that they haven't only gained knowledge and classmates, but they've gained eight new friends. And that's always my goal. I always express that this is one of the reasons why, like Siobhan, I do the same groups for the entire semester because it's like a family. They come in on Fridays and they're they're just they just unload on each other. They have the best time. They know how each other thinks. They know what to say. Um and so I really do feel that they've built interpersonal skills and they've made friends. And I think one of the keys to the success of the assembly is that the work is done as an individual. They do the facilitation guide alone, and then they have me there and they have the TA's support also. And the collaborative, the collaborative part comes in the classroom space. And so by the time they get to that point, they've already built their confidence up through getting some feedback, talking through their questions and sort of posing some insecurities that they might have going into a 30 minute session. And so I think that helps a lot, but I just ran into a student at the grocery store um, the other day and she's like, I still meet up with my 280 group. And I think she was in the class four years ago. So that's, that's saying something. Um, so I think it is, it is fun. Um, but I'll have to go back and look at my student evals and then I will send another note to you guys on how that went. I can't, maybe I'm too optimistic. But I do remember the, I was a disaster in the technology in that 2021 myself with all the stuff going on. So I can only imagine they were like, yeah, okay, no more. <laughs> uh, we are at 15 minutes too. I would like to pose some questions um, that have been put forward. Uh, Laura Meek had a really great question. Um, 
she asks, um, I'm also really interested um, in this. Uh, she says, I'm wondering how you've all uh, incorporated collaboration into your own work. And did you receive or provide training in how to collaborate? That's a really good question. Um, yeah. I think um, I have not received any training in collaborative work up to this point, but I collaborate every single day. Um, I think probably like Arts ICT, I wasn't at the presentation, but I can imagine our department uses teams probably in a similar way. Like for all committees, the, the chair has uh, a channel with the committee members, all the documents are there to organize and stuff like that. Um, so there's that side of teams that helps facilitate the the team dynamic of an academic committee, for example. Um, and then on grants and things, I think collaboration has saved me because, you know, sometimes I'm up at like 530 in the morning and I've got time and I want to work on my part of something and I want to share it. And then you know, it just gets things going in ways that are functional for me and also for the other team members. And so I'm I'm very used to collaborating like that, but I cannot remember if I've, I, I don't recall ever receiving training on working with others. <laughs> Unless it was a, I was a part of a TA team as a graduate student. I remember that, that we had a coordinator and we worked as a team to create exams and things like that. But beyond that, no. Um, <clears throat> I also haven't received any formal training, but just on the job, like I would say maybe one third of my courses have been team taught over the years. Um, and so that's really, really close collaboration with the other instructors on the course. Um, and then I actually do a lot of research uh, across disciplines. And um, that's just been really fun and interesting. I think Siobhan mentioned that as well. <clears throat> Learning, uh, you know, how people approach things in engineering or whatever. Um or whatever discipline. And um, I do find though that the university structure where you are sort of submitting your merit report as an instructor each year and literally competing for bonuses with other faculty in your department kind of fosters like a culture where you're supposed to identify all the things that you've done and not really emphasize the collaboration. And so I have found the most successful collaborations are actually with people at UBC, but outside of my department where we're all sort of mutually benefiting and we're not positioned institutionally in any kind of um, competition. Yeah, I'd just say echo what, what, what Catherine said there that I think for me also being, um, in, well, I mean, being a part of the educational leadership as well at UBC means we've had to create, uh, and because I've been in it almost since it was created. And so what does it mean? And, and the only way when, you know, at the beginning, being one of the only faculty members in my department, have, just by nature, having to reach out and work with others. Um, and so that that is a benefit in itself. Like, and and then of course, yeah, working across disciplines. Any formal training? Uh, what I will say, and anyone who's interested, what I find most helpful, and I hope it's there in your discipline, um, in geography we have, and then I've also done it in my software work, but we have like collaborative writing groups where, as part of conferences, and that you you actually write a paper together on a topic. Um, it, it comes from in 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 the kind of more science the geosciences they tend to write multiple authors on a paper so in the human social sciences we've kind of brought that in too in that uh, yeah it's around working together usually in a like a fixed period of time um, to uh, to to write a paper on on a topic um, and that that for me was. So I did one as a grad student, I think. Yeah. And then I've done three since then as a, fa a faculty member. And, and those are all that international collaborations. So that then helps. But and I, I would encourage you to seek that out if that is something in your discipline. If not, definitely, if you're interested in SOTL, the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, it's a huge uh, piece of SOTL research. It has to be collaborative, you know but it might be there in, in, in your respective disciplines as well. 
you know, just learning by doing and, you know, them in groups making mistakes and dealing with maybe uncomfortable social situations and such, right? These are all part of the learning experience. And I don't, I, I, I know all of you are great models for this in your classrooms. So uh, that's in the literature anyways, that's what students have uh, said that they, they need most is uh, good role models on how to collaborate in the classroom. And that can be done at the lecture level. And then that can feed down into the the discussion groups and uh, and group work, right? So, uh, Jason, do you have any um, last minute questions, or have you seen any questions in the chat? I think there the was one in the chat. I think it might have been answered in the chat, but about mm -hmm. um, what I guess there was the question of what portion of class time dedicated to collaborative work, and then also the grade weighting. How do you decide how much to make it worth? Yeah. So I don't know if there's anything any of you want to add to either of those questions that weren't already answered in the chat. That's about a third, uh, roughly just under a third overall over the course of the term, but worth 15%. So it's it's not quite, it, it, for the reason that I said that, that uh, in, uh, this is, I'm talking about the first year context. As I go higher up in the levels that I teach, I would increase the weighting but not necessarily the amount of time in class, um, because I feel that for first years, you know, it's still a, a it's a process, um, and so I, you know, don't allocate as much of the grade, but still the same amount of class time. Yeah, and I think uh, Catherine and Brianna both uh, answered in chat, right? Yeah. Yeah, any other questions, Jason, that, that you have any follow-up? No, I don't think so. Um, no? I think... Well, I mean, we're basically at the end of our time, but I, I would just, I'd really like to thank all three of you for taking part in this project. And uh, we do have a resource available for everybody. Jason, do you maybe want to... Oh, perfect. I, I, just, I just posted it. Yeah. So yeah, we just um, shared the, the evaluation report. Um, up on the Arts ICT website along. There's also some, uh, Catherine shared one earlier from her where we have all of the instructors participated here have a short teaching story that explains their um, activity in a little bit more detail. And um, Siobhan, you have your art, the article that we've linked to, the conversation article that we've linked to from there that describes the course and some of the evaluation results from, from each of the courses. So if you wanna learn more about what they've done, you can find them there. And, and if anybody has any questions about the evaluation report, um, we're happy to answer those later. You can reach out to us. Yeah. What I found most interesting about this report is that it draws a lot from the student experiences as well as the faculty experiences. So um, there, there's a lot of like illustrative quotes in there from students about the benefits and the barriers that they faced while um, participating in collaborative learning, as well as the technologies that they were using. So, yeah. Oh, thank you, Laura. Okay, and I'm very excited to see what all three of you do next in these sorts of activities and how they evolve. So yeah, I, uh, I hope that we get to do a follow-up study or something. That would be really great. Yeah. And uh, with that, I think we will say goodbye to everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, it was a pleasure having you all. So bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.